Welcome to the RE Human Layer Security Podcast, the show that flips the script on cybersecurity. I'm Tim Sadler, the CEO and co-founder of Tessian, and in each episode, I'll be interviewing IT and business leaders about why we need to protect people, not just machines and data, to stop breaches and empower businesses to achieve their missions. This week, I'm joined by Dan Raywood, a journalist who's probably best known as the deputy editor of Info Security Magazine, the role he held until the end of last year. Dan has been writing about IT security for nearly 12 years and is a former analyst in the information security practice at 451 Research. And if you've ever attended 44Con, RSA, Info Security Europe, or SteelCon, you've more than likely crossed paths with Dan. Dan and I first met a couple of years ago after being sat next to each other on a panel to discuss the skills gap in cybersecurity in the Houses of Parliament, and I'm delighted to have him on the podcast today. Dan, great to speak with you again. How are you doing? Yeah, great, Tim. Thanks very much for having me on. It's um, uh, you know, not ideal times, of course. I wish we could go back to Westminster and do a uh, you know another panel and talk about skills gap and all that kind of stuff, but we are stuck in this situation, and I think... You know, as we come up on a year, it's we're all, everyone's still trying to make the best of it. Absolutely. I mean, to think that I remember last March when the world was changing and everyone was going into remote work. Um, I was talking to my team and saying, you know, how long is this going to last for? You know, a week, two, maybe a month. Uh, to think that we would be where we are ten months later is 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 crazy. Um, oh, I was exactly uh, the same. Yeah, I remember talking to. So I I try and get the dates down. I've had this conversation many times over the last um, you know nearly a year now. And I, I it was I was at RSA, and I'm pretty sure you were there as well, which was end of February in San Francisco last year in 2020 get the dates right and um i think it was about monday the 16th or 17th something like that of march and um it was you know right you know don't come in tomorrow and i i was um from my event boss other than and she said something you know don't come in and i was like and she said this could be it for months and i'm like no we're back in two weeks <laughs> and then, but they were worse than i'd never work a day with her and the full team again because uh obviously i left in december so it's um I think, you know, you you kind of sink or swim in these situations and I I think everybody is doing a really good job of of surviving and, you know, doing the best they can. You know, like I said, I've left my job, others have left my jobs, but I don't think we've seen a lot of people kind of, you know, for example, we haven't seen any companies go under or anything like that. I don't think, I mean, there's been no reports of of major problems with companies because the world has continued to go onward, especially in cybersecurity. But I think overall, I think everyone is, is doing okay. Everyone's seen there's been enough collaboration in this industry to keep people sort of motivated to move onwards. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, I would agree. I think one of the surprising things has been how, um, how well the industry and uh, companies in general have held it together and adapted to the new way of working. But I, I did, um, I did want to sort of draw a, uh, some kind of timeline on the end of 2020. Um, I think the end of 2020 is kind of a good place to draw that. Because what I wanted to ask you was, you know, crazy year to be a journalist in security and just what your take was on all of that change in 2020. And mm-hmm. the reason why I draw the line is because things got even crazier since then. But before we talk about that, yeah, maybe just kind of give us um, give us your thoughts on what happened in 2020. How did this industry change? It was actually very, very interesting. That's a very interesting point because I think for the end of 2019, when I was still at InfoSecurity, obviously, I did like a sort of top 10 things we we learned or something like that, top 10 things that, that you may have forgotten about in, in 2019. And I thought about, could I do that again in 2020? Um, and I, the idea was, you know, you can – for each year you kind of go back and you think oh those were the key stories these are the, the kind of the key highlights you know that whatever things that change and it was really quite hard for 2020 because i don't think a huge amount really yeah you know the obvious i don't think anything massive really changed on we're trying to point someone towards someone's asking you know about you know can you point us towards some work you know some some writing you did and i'm thinking what really changed last year and the things that really really stood out for us for example like you know we saw more evidence of like nation state attacks especially on vaccine developers that's one thing that jumped out um and then what one of the last big article i wrote for info security was on the end of support for for adobe flash which we all kind of knew was coming anyway so it, it's funny because i don't think a huge amount really changed from 
the sort of the big headline sort of thing. But I think a lot changed in the way that people operated. Now, again, ignoring the remote work consideration, talking about the collaboration that went on, a lot of people were kind of like, you know, how can we help support other people, uh, you know, with, um, you know, collaboration efforts and things like that. And I think that that was what, what really stood out from last year was a lot of people coming together and saying, okay, you know, how can we make things better and, you know, all kind of ride through this. But it, you don't look back in, in 2020 and you think, well, you know, what, what really changed? And I think maybe, um, you know, if we had a conversation at, you know, New Year, you think, okay, you know, let's look back at all the highlights and you think, well, you know, there was the Black Lives Matter movement. There was, um, you know, you forget, you know, which which celebrities died and things like that. But so much changed. But you know, I think it was a year when not a lot really, really changed until the very end of the year when things just started to be, you know, really, really started to fluctuate. And I guess for me, kind of, that's, that's an interesting take. And I guess the, um, one of the most interesting points to me is that basically every organization went from having you know two or three offices to having like hundreds and thousands of offices with all of their people working in their front room and it's it's really interesting because a lot of people would have said well that may be one of the biggest shifts uh for cybersecurity, um both on the practitioner side on the employee side might be one of the biggest shifts that ever took place but you're actually saying well maybe but seems like you know the world carried on spinning and we handled it pretty well i think so and i think that uh you know the conversations we had i mean it did seem that obviously that the track and trace the app was full of technical problems but that's a different conversation um but i think i think that the, the what we're going to find going forward, certainly going forward, is, is you mentioned about the offices. I mean, I, I visited our office, which um, just so happens to be on the other end of London from where I live anyway. So it wasn't something I was kind of, you know, wandering past. And it was at most of the time, I think one of the last few times I went in, there were a few people in there. Some days I was looking at two or three of us and the floor that seats about 50. So I think, and that's probably pretty common across most businesses, I would say, you know, around the world. So I think one thing that's going to change is you're going to see a lot of businesses now try and, adapt to that so i think if you think of like big four companies we can think accountancies they've got offices all over london in one city in particular are they going to need all that space still so we're going to find probably a lot of office space becomes available and one of the things from that i think is going to see a lot more use of for example like, you know, smart building concept, I think it's going to become quite an interesting concept because then you're going to start looking at people using mm-hmm. smart lighting smart thermostats are they going to need to heat and light and secure buildings that they're not even using anymore and when people are using them they want to you know adapt for capacity so that i think could be something we're going to start seeing i don't know if businesses are doing that already but i mentioned like fluctuation i mean the big security story which just as i was leaving in for security was the solar wind story that that's kind of the big change but i think the thing other than that it's been a lot of change i think it's just been about survival last year a lot of companies like you said you know switching to remote working getting things in place and then just trying to you know do business as usual yeah and that's why i wanted to draw the line and uh, let's let's talk about soda wins so mm-hmm. if we think about um we've just spoken about everything that kind of happened before that big event in our industry soda wins hit how have things changed since then I think they've changed massively. It, it, I, we were just saying this before we recorded, actually, that, you know, the thing about Sony Winds, I, it, it, I think I, I left on Thursday the 17th, and I think it started coming out about that week. So I probably wasn't really that on top of it as it came out. And I've certainly been trying to keep up with it. So I'm certainly now I can get, you know, from everybody in the industry who isn't working in the media or, or PR or marketing, how they try and keep up with the industry news, because I'm now one of them where I'm not, you know, writing the news. So I'm trying to keep up with what's going on. I think the, the Sony Wind story, you know, when, when we release this podcast, I think, you know, the big learning point so far has been about supply chain security. And I think every now and again, you get a story which comes along and it substantiates what people have been saying. And the big challenge for su- supply chain security in particular has been sort of a lot of, it's been not theoretical stuff. It's a lot of like, you know, you know, it just takes that one weak link and, you know, there's a, there's a problem cause for everybody. And it's like, well, yeah, point to an example. I was like, okay, we'll try and think of one. And the other one really before this was the not picture one, which of course was the Ukrainian software. But here you've got a couple of example of a, of a technology company and, you know, they're not to blame. They're, they just got caught up in this and then it impacted all these other companies. So I think that is probably 
one of the big learning points here has been that actually they you know they got caught out and you know they and something i've been working on recently is you know that the, the apt thing isn't the big problem everyone says and i'm like well here it, here it actually was and yes they were quiet you know whoever the attackers were they were sort of sitting in the background and doing whatever they did and poisoned the you know the orion thing and it was you know that that's been the problem but i think for me it substantiates this supply chain issue and says you know here's an example that people will be citing for years to come now and you know in the much way they did with not pet europe probably not even to as much of an example this will be the bigger example that people can learn from and actually to sort of maybe roll out that kind of that not zero trust but that sort of less trust almost in what their third parties vendors are using yeah i agree i mean i think it uh, for any company that wasn't thinking deeply about that um supply chain risk already it's definitely definitely it's brought that into you know into full focus i mean one of the things that i've been thinking about myself is like this attack is just so far reaching you know i think there mm. are 18000 plus companies that have been impacted by this um you know what do you think the what do you think the chances are or the risk is i guess of it's so big that actually companies sort of think well you know this is this is kind of the worst breach we could have ever imagined mm. and again the world's carried on spinning like you know how like what do we what do we take from that what do we learn from that do we just sort of learn that actually if the worst thing imaginable does happen we'll probably be okay versus actually we do need to do it now we now need to do a complete rethink of how we're practicing security that's that's really 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 good point actually because yeah we've sort of survived in the past haven't we you know we've survived um i mean you can roll it back to so when i got first started writing um about cyber security was for sc magazine back in 2008 and you know i was sort of we were talking about configure i think it was i think it was either nine or ten i can never remember which which year which story without googling it um but i think the configure worm was the big one and i think i think that was either 2009 or 2010 and around the same time you had the google aurora attack so this nation state thing was always there but then you know we're writing about byod and we survived that you know the, the concept of bringing your iphone into work you know everyone blocking facebook you remember remember those days the mid-2000s every do. business <laughs> block your facebook because you know there's so much bad stuff on it and it's like well actually now uh you know i was listening to something you know recently about the whatsapp debate and you know actually it's about facebook connecting using whatsapp and all this this privacy de um, debate but the you know we, we survived those things and also we survived um the uh you know edward snowden revelations we you know and and chelsea manning we you know we survived that we survived um you know one of crime in 2017 i, I think it, there are so many hurdles and then there's a lot of people in this industry who say you know let, let's look at our successes and look at what we achieved rather than constantly sort of being negative and i think that will actually i mean i really obviously really hope so sort of survive this i'm sure they will you know there's a lot of people sort of saying you know this could have happened to anyone who's got third party vendor um uh, you know access is it could have happened to any one of those companies that that happen you know that that have that sort of access i mean but um i think the i think it's just going to be another stumbling point and you know people will carry on because security isn't going to be knocked over by something as straightforward as that completely i mean it it um it's an interesting take you know the the more attack the more threatened it is the stronger it gets over time right and resilience in in this case is is so key and, and there'll mm. be learnings as well but i guess of course the the key thing is that we don't necessarily know the extent to which this is going to be devastating for those companies because we don't really know the extent of what's been taken and how it affects you know each company and is there going to be a i know that some of the information that's been stolen has been um it's been made available for sale and i don't know you know whether anyone has actually verified that that you know those records or i think there's also source code that's been offered for sale but it could be that actually well whoever took this um information is you know maybe maybe they're going to sit on it for a very long time maybe they are never going to release it maybe they're going to release it all at a date in the future maybe there's some other motive at play here um you know we'd love to hear your thoughts on what we might expect uh in future developments off the back of this attack and uh again you know what this potentially could mean for companies that that have been involved 
yeah it fits into what we've heard about what they're calling like the double ransomware effect or the, the evolution of ransomware something i was writing about again sort of late november early december for info security and i one of the concepts i was going around was companies sorry sorry companies being hit by attackers and the attackers then sort of you know they go in and they you know do whatever you know that's bad you know ddos them whatever then they steal the data and then they sort of go away and say right if you don't pay us this amount of money we're going to release this it's always this kind of new version of ransomware rather than just the sort of locked you out sort of thing it's the we've got this and it's almost like this extortion way so you could say that's what's going to happen potentially to solar winds is actually they're going to have that sort of, of issue where you know the source code is gone and whatever but i think the Again, another another stumbling block, I think, was 2014, which was Heartbleed. I don't think, I think a lot of people have forgotten about that, actually, which I still think is one of the most sort of significant stories was about, you know, the open SSL certificates and you know, how many people were actually impacted by that. And I think if you actually start to realize this kind of code side of things and this um, this DevOps side of, sec of, of security where actually the, the, the code is out there anyway. Now, you know, is the source code being out there a really bad thing? Okay, it's not particularly great, but I think so much of these companies are now working off open source concepts anyway that is that the biggest threat to the company is actually having attackers having their source code to develop their products? Well, they can always, can they not just create new products that's a really terrible thing to say could they not just develop a new product that then sort of says you know, here's you know please don't use orion anymore use this new version because you know we know that's been compromised but this version you know we've been certified or whatever so yeah it, it, i don't know where we'll go with this one with, with this solo in story so it was one that just started to happen was the end of last year and i guess kept a lot of people busy over christmas as well Changing discussion very slightly, but I'm going to come back to this point about SolarWinds and the supply chain compromise. You've been writing about security for many, many years now. Um, and in this podcast, we we focus a lot on the human factor in security. I would love to hear from you, you know, your perspective, how has this concept of humans in the loop in cybersecurity evolved in all the years that you've been covering this industry and writing about security and you know where do you think we are today i don't think it's really evolved much at all unfortunately i think we're still having the same conversations that we were back in you know sort of like i said you know i i talk to people who you know have been doing security since the the 90s you know and, and, and back you know obviously it more than security back then but um you, know, you, you talk to people who, who go back and you just think, you know, what really changed? I just I just feel we're having the same conversation when it comes to these sorts of things. Now, like I said, there's been instances where we've sort of had a, an example set. Now, you know, we talked about insider threat sort of being kind of theoretical, probably until Chelsea Manning and, and um, uh, I forgot his name, Edward Snowden and he said Junior Assange, then, but he was the other one. Um, you know, and, um, you know, with that kind of example. So that was kind of almost gave it that sort of example. And I did actually do for info security i did like a top 10 insider threat cases and it was actually easier than i thought it was going to be because the more and more i searched the more and more i found and it wasn't any ranking of amount of record nicks or anything like that it was just 10 examples and the more and more i looked for it the more i could find and i just think that element of the human in the loop hasn't really gone away like i said said a bit just before it was 2010 we were talking about byod uh, concept uh, policies and mdm technologies which enabled people to use their own phones for um you know for work purposes and um it was that that concept which was was part of the humans sort of actually trying to interact with it not maliciously but actually trying to get their jobs done and then you know security had to catch up so that was you probably roll that back to about 2010 and since then it, it's been all about you know we talk about malicious non-malicious insiders and all this kind of stuff and um i covered end of last year or throughout last year i covered the ico reports on common reasons for data being lost and it's a lot of it's really simple stuff um i still wonder how many people are posting were posting stuff in 2020 when actually no one was meant to leave the house but we'll put that aside for now but i think i think just the human factor is, is never going to go away and a lot of the conversations i i've had have been like you know that, that don't consider this the human weakest strongest link is the other fact that controls just aren't there to enable there's something wrong with the controls if, if these mistakes keep getting made it's not about the, the person it's about something going wrong on the technical side and the, the uh, example i'll always put i won't mention the vendor but i was using a 2fa app on my phone and i 
could not figure out. I downloaded it, I could not figure out in the life of me how to get it working. So I went to their booth at Info Security Europe and said, look, can you run me through this? And now I get it. And I then explain it. How many people on the street can go and do that? Yeah, none. And same thing with technology. If it's too complicated, people just won't use it. And that's been the problem, really, is that if people you can point this towards the WhatsApp signal debate. People are familiar with WhatsApp now. They know it's actually pretty good technology. It's very secure and there's a lot right with it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put your own questions in if you disagree. But the whole thing is, you know, can you suddenly switch to do something different? And trying to get that mass movement of people to now start using a, a 2FA on their social, uh, social media or their email to now start to, um, uh, you know, various other security controls, such as, you know, switch to something like Signal because it's more secure. It's like, well, people think, well, this works and it's good enough. So, yeah, I'll stick with it. And I think that's the human factor is that you've got to make things work for people, not try and get people to work for you, to work with it. Yeah, because we often hear this um, this phrase, right? Um, you know what I'm going to say, but humans are the weakest link in cybersecurity. And I guess what you're saying is, yeah, maybe but mm. it's not their fault. And um, it is as much about user experience and their interaction with these digital systems as, as anything, right? Because, yeah. and I agree with you to the point that if you, um, adoption is always going to be the most important thing and, and engagement, right? And if people are, you know, if you're using, if you make a 2FA app that is so simple to use that, you know, you don't even need to, like the instructions are just single line or it's so intuitive, you don't even need to read a set of instructions. That's going to have much more of a security impact on people and society than something that's much more feature rich, but is complicated or it's hard to discover or it doesn't, you can't install it on your phone or, or whatever. And mm. I mean, from my perspective, I, I personally don't think enough is being said about this. And I, I would love you to challenge me on that, Dan, as someone who's covered you know, covered this topic and covered security, but I constantly hear from people, this is a people problem, not a technology problem. And I disagree. I've said it before on this podcast and in many other forums where I liken it to cars in the 1950s with no seatbelts, airbags or anti-lock brakes. And you'd pass your driving test and you'd be told good luck by the driving instructor. And if you never make a mistake, you'll be safe. And I kind yeah. of think that's where we are in security right now with security awareness and, uh, awareness and training, where we're training people to be phishing filters. Um, for some reason, we never trained people to be spam filters. We just invented a technology that took the problem away. But we've got to provide the assistive technology for people in the enterprise to say they are going to make a mistake. And when they do, this system is going to detect that mistake, stop it from happening, and help the user in the moment? I mean, to what extent do you agree, disagree, would challenge that? So, I'm just gonna revise the question that she <laughs> you know, how, how much is it down on the technology, do you mean? How, is, is the technology responsible for securing the person, do you mean? We could summarize it maybe as, is, is people in security a people problem or a technology problem? Oh, that, that's a good question, actually. I guess in, uh, yeah, that's, that's a hard one to answer, I guess, because you're talking about, you know, if, if, if people in security, you know, if, if you're talking about a sort of a wider workforce sort of thing, you know, where, you know, out, I mean, I'm not, everything is every human's fallible. And that's the thing. It's, there was some, some story, I think it was last week about, you know, I think it was uh, attackers from North Korea trying to target security researchers. And um, again, I don't, didn't look too closely at the story but you know that just proves that actually you know there are people out there to try and target you know everyone of course in the business email compromise stories we've heard about trying to target ceos and all that kind of stuff it's there's all this sort of social engineering which goes on and and trying to catch people out well usually of course for sort of financial reasons you know for fraud reasons um it, it's just i just think yeah that the, the people conversation is probably never going to go away because i think it, it's either about people trying to sort of do their jobs properly um, and are efficiently, especially again over the last 12 months, we all got suddenly got thrown into sort of situations. It's only, I think, very fortunate that everyone probably, most people now own a laptop. Um, I was very fortunate. I actually, the company I work working for, they actually provided laptops. So I was able just to pretty much work on something that having just literally been to San Francisco and worked for essentially a week on a laptop, I was pretty familiar with. So I was able just to carry on doing what I was doing. But if it's a job where you can't go in and you can't 
you know, or so you can't suddenly switch to a laptop. You know, how do you get your job done? So again, you find ways to do it. Now, um, whether it is an uh, an un unapproved device like an iPad or something like that, then that's 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 on the business to make that work. Really, and a conversation I had sometime recently was the next thing really will be businesses actually providing company a personal like your, your wi-fi at home almost because if you're on a multitude of different wi-fi networks and again you know i'm sure the the managed providers and the isps and all, they're all absolutely you know fine but if they want everyone to sort of say right we you know we we're going to ensure that everybody is on you know a certain standard of, of connection and they're going to start paying for wi-fi then you get into the ethical debates of like right does that mean they're going to monitor my access they're going to see what you know the family uses when it comes to netflix and iot and all those sorts of things so i think that that's that's where the, the people versus technology issue goes is that if the business can kind of if business is there to make it work then it's on the less is the problem the people are just sort of sit in the middle really it's about making the technology work for the people like i said earlier on really rather than trying to get people to fit into your mold you know it's not going to work like that <laughs> they might have worked that way in the 1950s and 60s when everyone sort of looked the same and operated the same but that's not the way we work anymore i think in in this time especially over the last probably since, since the turn of the millennium you know we've started to work differently you know fewer people are in the office now um I remember a conversation I had with someone who was a CISO. He was based, I think, in like DC or something like that. And he was CISO of a company based in Arizona. I'm like, how the heck does that work? You're not even in the same time zone, you know, let alone the same office. But that's the way things are going to go forward now. And you go into sort of 10 years' time, you know, who knows what the world's going to look like. But it could be one where office offices have changed and a lot more people are working from home. So it's about businesses enabling how they work. So sort of summarize <laughs> talking a while you know it, uh, strongest versus weakest thing i think they're not they're neither really i think they sort of you're sort of essential part of your businesses really i think you have to treat your employees that way because yeah sort of ai and automation isn't uh, advancing that well that you can replace entire workforces with uh you know with robots just yet yeah i i think the often when we think about a a CISO or a information security leaders we default to thinking about the technical technical aspects and technical challenges of security or securing systems. But there is also this leadership component to it, which is you have to empower your workforce. You have to empower every employee to do their best work securely. And if they can't do the job that you've hired them for, you've failed your mission as a, as a CISO. Um, and then also if they can do that work, but you get breached, then you know, you can't achieve your mission either. So it's a balance between productivity and security, but that leadership element and and actually getting people to engage and change behavior, I think is a is a really, really big challenge. Um, and you mentioned this concept of our personal security, which I think is a, a really important point. Many of us, you know, I think through the guidance and the controls that are put in place at our places of work, these are the these are the first things that we then see that help us improve our security in our personal lives. You know, okay, if the company's rolling out, uh, I'm thinking of you know five ten years ago rolling out things like two FA, then you start to think, okay, well, what, if the company's doing this, what is two FA, and do I have that on my personal email account, so on and so forth. Have you seen that to be, you know, is that a trend that you've observed over the over the past sort of decade as well, where people have actually gained um, greater fluency in their own uh, personal security because of their work security, or or has it been something different? I think people's privacy has has become more aware, and I mentioned thing with WhatsApp. I think people are much more aware of their own personal security and privacy now. I think if you go back 10, 15 years ago, people, I'm not saying everyone was clicking on phishing emails. But people are probably less aware of cybersecurity challenges. And I think the amount that the, the media covers it and gets it onto the front page of the national newspapers and, um, you know, and TV and stuff like that, I think a lot more people are aware. I think that that's just come with device usage. You know, it's, yes, we have to have got a population who use, it's global, use the same password across multiple, um, you know, multiple accounts. That, that's not, there's nothing you're going to do about that, unfortunately. That's just probably going to go on for forever. So, you know, it's about making, uh, you know, using 
authentication that works for people again i think that comes down to the technology so i think people are, are much more security aware than they once were um if they take what they learn at work and then you know actually adopt it to their adapt it to their um to their their private life then, then fantastic um but I think as as we've sort of seen in the last 12 months, you know, I think a lot more people are working with sort of IoT devices. So we like, you know, um, is it Ring? I don't know if Amazon do Ring, but, you know, Ring is the doorbell thing. Uh, you've obviously got things like Peloton have been really, really popular and other, you know, uh, bike exercise class, things like that. Um, and other stuff, some other IoT stuff has actually really been really popular. So are people thinking security first people are probably thinking you know what's the best device what's got the strongest quality more than most security but strongest quality probably also is probably one of the better security ones so i think generally people are more aware i wouldn't say everyone's an expert though yeah and we've definitely seen almost this concept of privacy and security as being a luxury good and apple are pushing this heavily and yeah. i have to say as a consumer i mean i think it I think it works, right? I mean, I, I, I care about privacy more more than ever. Um, maybe not surprising given my role in the industry that I'm in, but but yeah, I think when people know that they are um, they're making an investment in a product or a service that actually is going to make that commitment to protect their data to keep their identity private, I, I think that is um, it's a trend we're going to see more of, and I think it's going to be something that people think very carefully about as they do with the environmental impact of a good they buy and you know the social impact those kinds of things yeah i totally agree i think people are going to sort of think about where is my where is my data going i think gdpr hasn't as an element to do with that i think people have started to become more aware of where their data goes and uh you know who's got their personal data you know again data breaches have been so widely reported um and you know you started to see them now in these sort of class action efforts and you know people sort of you know you, your data was lost you know you can take action now that kind of thing so i think people have become much more aware of how much more visible they are um whether that's a generational thing, I think it could be because I think that the, you know, I'll say the label the teenagers is all being open, but they are much more open, uh, you know, with, with the way they are. So things may change in 20, 30 years when suddenly, you know, their people, somebody who's 15 will become, you know, be my age and they'll be like, you know, that's the way I worked when I was that age and, you know, their next generation. So it, it we might be facing in sort of, sort of, scary you know 2050s and stuff like that that people actually are a bit more open with the way they work with the way they they collaborate and share social media online and, and the way they share their details so if if people's privacy is is currently top of the sort of the ranking hopefully things but things you know, hopefully will be more secure by design in future anyway we started to at the beginning of this podcast we were talking about look back on the year that we've just lived and with a kind of tongue in cheek, knowing how useless our predictions would have been January 2020 about the year ahead. It seems like a good opportunity for us to talk about predictions for 2021 and the year ahead. <laughs> so what are you, you know, in this, in the midst of everything now, we've got solar winds, the developments there, we've had, you know, we've just seen significant political unrest in the US. Um, you know, we we are still dealing with the change of working from home. What are your predictions for the year ahead? What are the key things that you think are going to happen and shape the industry? And what are the things we should be watching out for? I hate to say it, but I don't think a lot's going to change. I think that's that's unfortunate. I think that's going to be the, the way things are going, um, you know, from, from now on. Having covered predictions for lots of years, you know, um, I actually, you know, I, I do pick up on the predictions. I didn't really do much in the, you know, the January just gone and the December just gone, just because I was, you know, leaving the job I was involved with. So I would, wasn't anticipating doing anything there. But I just, I just think we're at a stage when I don't think a huge amount is going to change until sort of the world changes, really. Because I think until people know that we're able to sort of work in in a more permanent way like this, or, or something is is new, I don't think a lot of people are going to sort of say this is this is. You know, we're going to do something radically different. What um, what we could see, I think, is more sort of uh, you know, we've, 
cybersecurity is built on essentially on mergers and acquisitions. Really, you know, it's been you know one company gets bought and then you know gets you know moved into part of it. You know, a lot of people walk away with lots of money and they form new companies. That's how you know that's how things work. I think we might see a bit more of that. I think there is going to be companies going out there actively looking to sort of. Uh, get sold actually or get bought up and I think that's going to create new money which will develop new ways of working which uh, you know, one thing we are seeing is as a real trend is like asset management as, as a technology and a few companies have emerged now with this concept of actually just it's not about you know beating the APTs it's not about the sort of all that kind of stuff it's it's more about actually knowing what on earth is actually running on your environment <laughs> and as a result now we're seeing companies emerge just with this asset management concepts as, as being their big driver of what their their product does so i think that's the way that the business is, is going to go in terms of security is knowing knowing what you are and essentially getting a much more of a better example of your sort of state of play um of what you're doing as a business and you know what servers are running where who's accessing what and stuff like that so what's the main thing is a lot a lot is going to change i think a lot of things are actually going to become a lot more about visibility and clarity yeah and um i guess what are the things what are the questions do you think we should be asking that we're not asking at the moment or the things that you're surprised aren't getting more coverage hmm that's a good one i guess politically is, is a good question actually i guess you know we're here in the uk now it's it's post brexit and you know i think there's a lot of people are presuming stuff about brexit about you know we we now don't have to comply with gdpr and we don't have to uh fit in with this sort of thing i think that's that sort of thing is a lot of the questions need to be asked around okay where, where do we stand now as part as the uk stand as part of the the global side of, of security now and you know how does our the other thing actually one other big story from last year which i don't think a lot of people really got affected by was the end of privacy shield um which again i'm rubbish on dates but i think was probably about uh, august september something like that you know where does the future of that go in terms of data transfers and getting uh you know global businesses being able to work especially you know, as now we're much more reliant on on you know online working how does that change and I think the, the data protection compliance side is actually going to be probably that's always a driver anyway for, for cyber security is actually making stuff secure in the first place so i think that's going to be a conversation that needs to be had is around uh yeah data protection globally moving from one place to another and obviously the legal side of it so yeah i'm sorry to say but i don't think a huge amount is going to change in 2021 i think a lot of things are going to stay much the same unless something like solar winds happens again and all of a sudden everyone has to react to it or another wanna cry happens or something like that which you know obviously we don't want to happen because you know it does affect businesses and it does affect people's lives but well, at the same time is it does drive change and th those two incidents in particular you know they, they changed the way people operated you know it's all of a sudden there was a shutdown of smb uh, uh the the uh, the open uh, node or whatever it was that actually you know, enabled one to to spread and you know it will create more conversation solar winds about supply chain security so those things they will change the the dynamic and the way people operate but at the same time i just yeah i'm just at a stage thinking i think we'll get to the end of this year and whatever life looks like who knows <laughs> i'm just glad to have made it to february um but um yeah a lot will will have stayed the same and i think a lot of things are just going to be very reactionary which is what security often has been anyway it, it, it's always been about you know what happened let's deal with it later so much of it which we probably don't hear about is actually is the proactive stuff you know where we where an attack was sort of you know was was prevented because that's not what it's about it's about the successful attacks unfortunately and hopefully you know just things will continue to be more positive that's great dan thank you so much for joining us today it's been so good to hear your thoughts and the predictions that you have shared and um, you know it's always a safe bet to say that you know nothing will change for the year ahead but you know maybe you're right maybe we've we've had all of our uh, all of our bad news and all of our um all of our changes come in the first sort of month of this year who knows um i think we've had enough news for the past year to um to satisfy all of us anyway definitely yeah real pleasure tim thanks for being we here. always finish the podcast by trying to get to know the people behind the human layer security podcast a little bit better and we ask some quick fire questions uh, so dan i'm going to ask you to finish these sentences for me the book listeners must absolutely read is blank 
Um, in cybersecurity, I'd read something called The Cuckoo's Egg. Uh, I got this from listening to lots of podcasts, and everyone kept recommending it, and I read it on a holiday about two years ago, and it's really, really good. And the best piece of advice I was ever given was? Um, do you know what? I mean, this is my, my f- first interview, or the interview I got for my very first job, and I remember talking about could I understand what they were talking about? And I remember seeing, a, a th- I think on the, the, the guy was interviewing me, the t- editorial director, and he said, don't have um, too much of an open mind, your brains might fall out. So <laughs> I think he's always trying to um, keep an open mind to what people are saying and you know, try and listen to every point of view because it's good to hear sort of conflicting perspectives because um, not everybody's wrong, not everybody's right. That's great. Dan, thank you so much. And that just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. We'll be back with more Human Layer Security Insights in our next episode. But if you can't wait that long, you can visit our blog at tessian.com forward slash blog, where you'll find lots of amazing content, advice, and tips. And if you enjoyed our show, please rate and review it on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. 